family, listen, loved ones, this is the time of year when people who don't even believe in God, they give Jesus a possibility. Maybe, just maybe, <clears throat> I'll go to church that, but they've been to church so many times on Easter and on Christmas, <clears throat> and they still don't believe, right? Uh, let's, let's, let's make a pact right here, you and I. I'll make you a deal. <clears throat> I'll pray if you pray <clears throat> that somehow, some way, that God will break through that darkness this one time and bring his light into their life. And you just never know what's going to happen when they come, right? You just never know. When, when, if God is here and they experience his love and his presence and his power, they might, you might just see them on their face right here at the altar. You just don't know, right? You don't know. He said, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and I'll answer. So just pray your guts up between now and then, and let's just see what God will do. We've been seeing what God will do a lot lately. And I told you recently about um, this prayer that we've been sending up vertically. We've been talking to the Lord about our sound system. And, and uh, I just want to let you know that uh, it's moving forward. We actually received our brand new 32-channel fully digital Behringer soundboard yesterday. We already have it. It's awesome. And so, uh, and from what I understand, I don't know, uh, God is spoiling us. I think that there may be a brand new computer system back there here very, very soon as part of this whole situation. So praise God for that. Just super, super excited. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook, I want to welcome you. I don't know where you are, but I'm certainly glad uh, that you're with us. And I know that our dear sister in the Lord, Ashley, who sits right there in that recliner, she is not feeling well tonight. And so we know that you're not able to be here, but we just want you to know that, let's hear you are loved. You ready? We just want you to know that you are totally loved. And Steve... And Kay as well. So glad you're here with us. And we're going to crack our Bibles open in and, and just a moment. But before we do, I, I, was, I was reading my Bible this week. And I hope that you were doing the same thing. And, and when I was reading my Bible this week, I was super, super excited. I, I stumbled upon this amazing truth. And it started, it was like almost 3,000 years ago. It was a bunch of like these old Jewish guys. And they, they must have known something. And so they talked about this fact that we're helpless man and and we got problems and and so he's going to come and he's going to fix that problem for us and so he he talks about this this god that will come down from heaven right and 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 he's a messiah and he's going to deliver us from our big problem of sin that we can't help for ourselves. and so he talks about this messiah that's going to come and that he's going to be born of a virgin and and he's going to save everyone. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. And then all of a sudden, I was reading more. I don't know if you read this, but there's this, this young girl. Her name is Mary, and she's a virgin. And all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, hey, you're the chick that's going to happen to. You're going to have God in your stomach, and I'm going to put him there, and you're going to deliver this me. Isn't that awesome? Did you guys know this? Of course you know this. You've all heard this a thousand times. It's, uh, it's certainly not new, but it's very, very exciting. Very, very exciting. So exciting, we've been talking about it for over 2,000 years. We've been talking about it, and not just on Christmas. We're talking about it every week. Hopefully talking about it every single day. It's definitely not new, and it's certainly exciting. But I did find something in the Christmas story that I thought was definitely not new, but super, super exciting. And I want to share that with you tonight. And listen, you have to get this. Okay? You have to get this. If you don't get this, you don't get nothing. You got to get this, okay? So... Because you got to get this, and we understand that it's crucial. <clears throat> I, can't do, I can't do the job. I can be a mouthpiece, but I can't do the job. I could sit up here and be the greatest speaker on the planet, but unless the Holy Spirit attaches himself to these words and it rushes upon your heart, nothing will happen. So, if you're willing, take a moment with me and let's, 
let's just do what Christians do. If you're new here, I know see some new faces, you might think we're totally crazy talking to a ceiling. Humor me. We believe that our God is listening. We believe that he's here right now in his, by his spirit, and he's here to not only talk to you and to love you, but to teach you and also to hear your praise. And he was, when we were singing, I know he was smiling. He was smiling, man. So let's pray. Let's pray and let's ask him to do an incredible work here. God, we, uh, we are so very grateful for this weekend. And Lord, I understand that people object to Christmas in so many ways. Everyone's got their opinion on it. There's only one opinion that matters. It's yours. Mine doesn't matter. Nobody else's matters. Your opinion on this day, no matter what it says on a calendar, this is your day that you have made, and it is a perfect day to worship you. Whether it was a celebration, a remembrance of, of the day that you came, or not, it's still a good day to worship you. It's still a good day to, to, to bow before you and to let you lead us, Lord. It's a great day for that. And so, Lord, we would just give ourselves over to you right now, and we would offer our bodies as living sacrifices. We would bow and be humble before you and just ask that you would be lifted up and that we would be lowered and all of the schedules and all of our priorities would be laid aside in the presence of the great king. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would do as your word promises he will do, and that is to lead us into all truth. And so, Lord, let the words of this preacher be guided by your spirit and let the hearts of your people be pierced by your spirit so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth all the days of our lives. Use this tonight, this time, to help frame our worship moving forward. We thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, so, awesome. So why don't you do me a favor, like we do here all the time. What am I about to do? Tell me what I'm about to do. Yes, I love you guys. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And, and I'm not going to, listen, if you want to know the Christmas story, if what I was saying a moment ago, you're like, wow, that's amazing news. I never heard that before. Like, if you've never heard that before and you want more, definitely be here on Monday night. We're going to go through the whole story so you can have a full uh, glimpse of exactly what happened. And uh, tonight I'm not doing that. Tonight I'm going to read uh, two verses from this Christmas story. And we're going to... We're going to just pause right there, and we're just going to learn something from this. It's an awesome truth, and I believe it's going to bless your heart. So if, uh, if you're in Matthew chapter 2, just go ahead and let me know if you're there. You're there, okay, because I don't want to leave anyone behind, right? Um, chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You all knew that, right? Okay, cool. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men were uh, from eastern lands. Where were they from? Yeah, we don't know exactly, right? If God wanted us to know, he would have put it in there, right? Awesome. And, and so about that time, uh, some wise men from eastern lands uh, arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Right? That's the exciting news. You know, it's funny. These, these guys, these wise men, they, they, they traveled a great distance to, to worship a king, but yet Jesus hadn't had any formal coronation, right? Any, anyone ever seen uh, Frozen? Right? And, they get the, and, 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 the, and the city's open, and they got this big thing, and they get up on the, on the stage on this big chair, and there's the crown and the gloves and the... A big deal, right? Uh, did Jesus have one of those? No, he didn't. He, he never had a formal uh, coronation. He never had a, a an, he didn't have an Old Testament prophet like show up or something in the stable and say, hey, you know what? Someday you're, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be the king. 
And, you know, that happened with, like, King David, right? King David was an awesome king. And in and and Old Testament prophet, this guy Samuel, he, like God said, and that's the guy. I want you to go tell him he's going to be the king someday. So he went over there. He said, hey, you're going to be the king, right? Well, that's, that's awesome. But that didn't happen with Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus hadn't done anything to earn the title of king yet. Uh, here on earth, he was just born. I don't know how long ago was he born. I, I don't know. Just, like, recently, Right? Uh, could have been an hour, could have been two hours, could have been a day, I don't know, but he was definitely just born. And so with no coronation and, and, and not proving himself in any way, um, these guys have come to, to worship. Now we understand later on in life that Jesus, you know, he gave sight to the blind. And feel free to say amen anytime you want to. Um, just if you think that Jesus is awesome and you want him to know about it, you can just let him know. He, he, um, he gave sight to the blind and he... he uh, he cleansed lepers, and he stopped, inter- like this woman had bleeding, like internal bleeding or something for like 12 years, and she went to every single doctor and spent all of her money, and she couldn't get healed, and just by simply touching the fringes of his robe, the bleeding stopped, and, and paralyzed people were walking again, and, and he was casting out demons and walking on the water. And, and there was a big storm, and he's sleeping in the boat. And the, and, and the storm's freaking out his guys. And he, he gets up, and he's like, stop. Right, done. And, and then he goes, and uh, he raises some dead people from their grave. That's awesome, right? And, and, and that, like, that should be enough, but, to, but it's not enough. Because to top it all off, then he raises him. How does he do? He raises himself from the grave and just walks right on out of there. That was a really good place. Wow, you blew that one. You blew that one. And he walked out of the grave. All right. Awesome. Awesome. See, this is the part where you get to participate in the sermon and you get to let these slackers who are going to show up tomorrow, you got to let them know how we party on Saturday night, right? Yeah, that's right. Amen. Right. Okay. So, so we're dorks now. So when we party, we just say amen. Right. That's what we do. No, but but listen, when when we realize, you know, when he when he gets older and he's cleansing the lepers and the blind people are seeing and the paralyzed people are are walking and and the and the dead are being raised from the grave. Right. Then we bow. That's easy to bow to a dude like that. Right. That's easy to bow to a guy like that. Because of what he did. But here are these wise men. And they're ready to worship this king. And they're ready to bow down before him. And he hadn't done anything yet. Like, why is that? Well, I was thinking about it this week. And maybe, maybe that's why the Bible calls them wise men. Maybe they're wise because they might, maybe they knew something that was beyond the norm. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe just maybe our, our human or our historic or our, our, our social, cultural standards, maybe they don't apply to King Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, that's why they were wise. Maybe, just maybe, the creator doesn't need to prove anything to his creation to be its king. Right? Did you know? Did you know that this whole idea of him having to prove himself, it's rampant. And, and, and Paul tells us in the book of Romans that this God complex, this, hey, you need to prove yourself to me before I bow to you, that that whole thing that we're all prone to, you need to prove yourself, Jesus. I'll go to your church when you walk on water, Tom. I'll, I'll, go, I'll worship Jesus when he... And you name it. And, and Paul said that this has been running rampant forever. What, is, what do I mean by that? Well, do me a favor and look at Romans chapter 1. A little extended section of, of Scripture. I'm just going to read it to you. But I know you all love the Word of God, and so I feel very free to read this. I'm going to drink a sip of coffee before I do that. Well, you know you have to drink coffee when you're in ministry, right? You guys know that? Yeah, it's in Hebrews. So, that is such an old joke, and I pulled it off again. That was awesome. Yet again, it was a good one. Romans chapter 1, 
Look in verse 18. Let's just read a little bit through 32. So it's a little bit, but, you know, it's good. But God chose his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people... Herb, you're in King James right now, aren't you? What does it say? Does it say people? Verse 20. What's it say? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Right. So I just want to make sure that all these different Bible vers versions don't exclude people, right? Ever since the world was created, people, like anyone, whoever lives, if you're on earth, you can see. If you can see something, you, you know something. It says that for ever since the world was created, so that's not just like recently, that's since when? Like the beginning? Right? Adam and Eve time? Way, way back. People, everyone, has seen the earth and the sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they, are, they have no excuse for not knowing God. Everyone knows there's a God. There's a God, okay? Everyone knows it. Yes, they knew God, like they knew that there was one. But what does it say? But they wouldn't worship him as God. That's the problem right there. Everyone knows who, everyone knows that there is a God, but no one will worship him for who he really is or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead become utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their sh shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, right? Acknowledge him for who he is. That's the problem. And all this stuff stems from that. And because we do this, it says he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives become full of, listen, every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So this is Paul writing the book of Romans. But this is an indictment on us. This is an, listen, don't be fooled to think that this old dusty book was just written to them. That's an indictment on us and every single one of you that either read it just now or heard my voice, you could hear America des described to a T right there. Because we will not acknowledge God, we will not worship God for who he is. 
And that's a massive problem. What God wants to do is he needs to change our perspective. He needs us to worship him for who he is, not what he can do for us. Okay? That's what we need. When we evangelize, you know you go to people and you're like, hey man, you should accept Jesus. Because if you accept Jesus, he's going he's gonna to save you. He's going to save a place in heaven for you. And if you accept Jesus, he can deliver you from your illnesses and all your strife and all of your problems. And all your kids are going to be blessed. And you're going to be blessed. And everything you lay your hands to is going to be blessed. And we tell everybody, oh, if you do this, if you, take Jesus, if you get Jesus, here's all your benefits. Here's all your benefits. Here's all your benefits. And are those things true? Yes, they are. They're very, very true. But is that the reason why you should worship him? No. You worship him for who he is. You don't worship him for what he can do for you. Right? He is God, and he deserves to be praised at all times. All the time. All the time. See, this thing that, that Paul's saying in the book of Romans, this is a universal indictment against all of humanity, including right now. And you can see America in this. This is a problem that we have. We will not acknowledge God for who he is. We will not worship him for who he is. It's a massive problem. See, there's a massive problem when we think that the sun revolves around the earth because we live in it. Because we're so awesome that everything revolves around us. That's a massive problem. And, and it's like a house that's, that's built on a crooked or a broken foundation. Eventually, everything starts to crumble. That's a massive problem. And that's the problem that Paul is telling us here in Romans chapter 1. We don't worship God for who he is. We don't bend our knee and bow down before him for who he is. We want him to prove himself to us. You need to prove yourself to me before I worship you. And when we think God needs to prove himself to us in any way, shape, or form, you put yourself in a very dangerous place. He doesn't have to prove anything to anybody ever. The scripture says from everlasting to everlasting, I am God. No proof, no justifying anything. That's who I am. I am the great I am, and you're not. Worship me. Listen, nobody likes to be yelled at and told what to do, but I'm yelling at you and telling you what to do. And when you do it, you will find joy. You will find joy. When you give yourself over to Jesus and you bow your knee to him, whether you want to or not, whether he's done. Listen, he has done stuff for you. You just haven't recognized it as such. Are you breathing? Did you eat today? Praise God. We worship him for who he is, not for what he can do for us. So let's, uh, let's just go back like... <clears throat> 800 years before Paul. And let's talk about one of these old dead guys. Isaiah chapter 45. Just go back there real quick. Let's just see if this has been like going on for a while. Paul says it's been going on for a while. We don't, wanna, <clears throat> we don't want to uh, base our relationship on the Lord on one little section of scripture, right? That's dangerous. People do that. And I don't want to do that here with you. If we're going to base our worship on something, it should be something that you can find as a strand throughout all of Scripture, right? So you saw what was happening over there in the New Testament, Romans. How about here in chapter 45 of the book of Isaiah? 800 years before Jesus shows up, Bethlehem, you got some people whining and complaining and prove yourself to me. And what does he say in chapter 45, verse 9? What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? <laughs> yeah. Does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? How terrible it would be if a newborn baby said to its father, why was I born? Or if it said to its mother, why did you make me this way? Can't you just see it? Can't you just, this is people. You need to do something. You need to do something, God. You don't need to do anything, yo. 
Nothing. Nothing. Who would dare? Read on. This is what the Lord says. I love that too. It's like, shut up and listen. The Holy One of Israel and your Creator. This is who I am, right? We're worshiping Him for who He is, not for what He's... Listen, before He does anything, what does He say? This is who I am. Listen up, right? Listen up. Do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the work of my hands? I am the one who made the earth and created people to live on it. With my hands, I stretched out the heavens, all the stars at my command. Right? I don't have to do anything for you. Why are you even... Shh. This is a position problem, right? This is what, this is what Isaiah is talking about. It's a position problem. You think you're up here and you can tell, somehow tell the God of heaven and earth, the one who spoke the, the universe into existence, and you can tell him what he needs to do. It's a position problem. And, and we need to learn to be humble before the Lord and, and, and bow down. And so, You know, sometimes when we pray, it's so good to... Come to the altar, right? There's not, is there anything mystical, magical, wonderful about the front of this stage here? Nothing. But you know, it says something to the Lord when you just get down low, because that's what worship is, right? Worship is when you exalt something, right? So we step down off the stage and we say, God, you are, I, I saw you and you were on your throne and you were high and lifted up and I'm not and I'm down here. I'm just little and I'm nothing and you're everything. That's worship. That's what we do. And the problem with mankind is that we refuse to do that. We are stubborn, rebellious people, and we want to be God. And we want to tell him what he needs to do in order for me to worship you. And he's like, wrong. Flip that thing, man. You got something wrong here. It's a position problem. I am, right? I am. So, so that was like... 800 years before Bethlehem, but why don't we like fast forward at 800 years and surely, surely they'll get it, right? Surely they'll get it now, all these years and, and, and God's been working on them and they'll get it and let's fast forward it to our time now, another 2,000 years and finally people will get it, right? That we're supposed to worship God because of who he is, not because of what he can do for me. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Right? Him. Right? Not, not his stuff, not his blessings, not his favor. Him. Right? He's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Come after me for who I am. Right? And if you come after me for who I am, what's the promise? Reward. Reward, right? But if you come after the rewards, you might never get him. And what a, what a shame it would be to go a whole life and have the opportunity to have an intimate relationship with the one who created you, and you forego that just to chase down his stuff. It would be a shame. I've heard it said, if you have everything and you don't have him, you've got nothing. But if you have him and have nothing, you have everything. And that's the mindset that we need to have. An, a Christian should be earnestly seeking him. And then he'll be rewarded. Okay, so here we are. It's Christmas time, right? And so we're thinking about, you know, Jesus. And he's in the manger. And the question's still there. Because he made some claims about himself, man. Right? Right? He said some things about himself. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? And, and so you have to make this decision again, again, again. We are, listen, as the creation, we are responsible to respond to what the Creator does. Before Jesus was born in the manger, it is our responsibility to, to worship God, even though we can't see him. We worship him. And if he decided to come down in the form of this cone and said, this is me, I need you to bow, what's our responsibility? Write down. As, as crazy as it might seem, 
That's our responsibility because we're, again, we're not the creator. We're the creation. And so he has shown himself in Jesus. And so the Bible would say this. Uh, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. Right? The word was with God and the word was God. And, and, and he created everything. So at that point, when you're reading that, you're like, man, i got to know what this word is. What's the word? What's the word? i got to know if the word was with God and the word was God and the word created everything and the word sustains everything and what? I need to know. Verse 14. This word, this, this thing, this person, this power, this whatever, it's, what that word is, okay, what is that? Well, it put on skin and came down and dwelt with us. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the only one who ever came down from heaven, right? He came down. Emmanuel. God with us, right? So it's not just like there was a God and now here's Jesus. No, it's God with us. He's right here. That's who Jesus Christ is, right? Don't let anyone tell you anything different. That's who Jesus Christ is. God in the flesh, in our presence. Colossians chapter 1. I'll read this to you. Favorite section of scripture. Colossians chapter 1. More. More. Description of who Jesus is. Jesus, verse 15, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Listen, existed over any, before anything was created. So could Jesus Christ be a creation? If he existed before anything was created, could he possibly be a creation? No. Okay. And he is supreme over all creation. Has he done anything yet in this description? No. He just is, right? That's why you worship Jesus Christ. That's why you bend the knee to him. That's why you lower yourself down. That's why you praise him, because of who he is. He is supreme over all creation, for through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we could see. And the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in unseen worlds. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So he is first in everything for God in all how much all in all his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ we bow that's what we do we bow to who Jesus Christ is not for what he can do for us that's what we do and so listen so there's the creator he's come down from heaven he's standing right there in front of you the creator of all things the sustainer the one who in him all things are held together and he's standing right there in front of you now and well my question to you is will you bow or will you demand proof that's the question No fancy transitions to this, so do me a favor and look in John chapter 6. God doesn't need my help. John chapter 6, people again. People again, guilty of this same thing. Prove yourself to me, God. You do this, and then I'll. You do this, and I'll go to church. I go to church, but if you do this, then I'll put something in that basket. I put something in the basket, but you do this, and then I'll help you. Then I'll tell someone about you. So much running around in Christianity. Everyone telling everyone else what's most important, what they should do, what they shouldn't do, how the salvation should look, how you're supposed to serve, how you're supposed to give, how you're supposed to dress, how you're supposed to sing. This is the most important part. This is the most important part. Verse 29 of chapter 6, Jesus tells him this. This is the only work God wants from you. 
believe in the one he sent. That's it. Believe in the one I sent. Believe in the one who put on flesh and came down. Right? All the other stuff is going to happen on its own. This is what you need to do. And it's not about what you can do or what he can do or what he's done. Listen, just believe in me. When he was sent, he was a baby. He hasn't done anything. He's just sitting there in a, in a crib, crying. You have to try to figure out which denomination Jesus belongs to when he's in a crib crying. Jesus says, now listen, this is what I want you to do. Just believe in the one that he sent. That's what I want. Because of who he is, right? Worship me for who I am, not for what I can do for you. <laughs> and then they answered him. Paraphrase. Yeah, that's not good enough. Sorry, God. That's not good enough. See, because I'm God and you're not. So I need you to prove yourself to me. I mean, because, you know, speaking the universe into existence, that's not going to cut it. I just need more proof than that. Okay, Lord. And, and so they say, um, yeah, well, I know that that's what you want. I want you to just, you know, put me where I belong. That's what Jesus is saying there in this believe in the one he said. He said, just put me where I belong. I'm king. I'm Lord. Believe in me. I'm the Lord. And they're like, yeah, that's not going to cut it. So why don't you do this? Um, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. You know, there's a lot of miracle chasers out there. There's a ton of miracle chasers out there in Christianity. And they, they probably, no doubt, they love the Lord. That's fine. I'm not questioning that. They're chasing miracles. Because that's evidence of God. I have news for you. He doesn't need to prove himself to anyone ever. You understand? If, if, if you never lived and this world never existed from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. He doesn't need to do anything. Anything that he does is for his glory and your blessing. He doesn't need to do anything for anyone to prove himself. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's it. Whether you think so or not, whether he proves it or not, they said, you see it here, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. <laughs> I could just see God going, really? Right? Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? Can you imagine the gall? You go up to Jesus Christ, what can you prove? What can you do? Right? He should have smacked him. I mean, if I was Jesus, I would have smacked him. And no one would, I don't know, actually probably a lot of people would go to that church, you know, but not, it wouldn't be a good church. It would be a bad church. It would be a bad church. Wipe that from the record. Okay, so, so they answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to do, if you want us to believe in you, what can you do? And so then they go back and they start talking about Moses in the wilderness. Like, that was awesome when he, you know, when, he, when he's leading the people out of Egypt and there's manna from heaven. Like, that's awesome. That's a great miracle, right? Did you agree? Like, you're starving all of a sudden, you know, cloudy with a ch chance of meatballs because I start falling down from the sky. Like, that will be rocking, right? So, so he quotes this, right? He's like, hey, after all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. So, they, see, they, had, they thought very highly of Moses. And, and he was a great dude. And he did great things. But remember, it's a position problem. See, they're putting Moses now where God belongs. And, and, most, and, and, and really, they think that they have the right to put Moses where God belongs, which ultimately doesn't put Moses in the place of God. It puts them in the place of God, because they get to decide. And that's way, way, way wrong. So it says, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus, rolling up his sleeves... Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. Like, can you imagine that? Like, boom! You think you know everything. He says, my, my, listen, that's a big thing when he says, my father did. My father did. 
That puts him in a place of preeminence right there, right? Moses didn't do anything. My father did it. And now my father offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's like, the one who came down, stepped down off of his throne, put on skin and dwelt among you, he's the one who gives life to everyone. Moses is nothing compared to me. He just dethroned their greatest leader ever and stepped in and said, I'm the boss. I'm the real thing. Are you living? Yes, it's because of me. Are you breathing? Yes, it's because of me. Are you eating today? It's because of me, not because of Moses. It's awesome. Awesome truth. And listen, God of heaven, that's who he says he is. I am God of heaven who came down here because of my love for you. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. That's who was standing in front of them, and he stands before you today. And in Matthew 16, it tells this same story, but it elaborates a little bit more. And it says, it quotes Jesus saying that those people who base his authority on what he will do to prove it, are wicked and adulterous. Wicked. I need to prove myself to you? No, I do not. You are wicked and adulterous people. And so, all of this that I've shared with you this evening so far, let's, we could melt it all down into this very, very simple, simple statement that we'll find in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it says that Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. He is Lord and Messiah. That means not only is he, this is kind of, and this is hard to understand, but he is God of all gods, the fullness of deity who is pleased to dwell in Christ. So when Jesus stepped down off the throne, he didn't, his, his godly, Power and position was not diminished in any way, right? Even when he's in the crib crying, he is Lord right there. Hadn't done anything yet, but he's Lord. And he's also the one who's sent to put you into relationship with God. So he's God and the messenger and the one who brings you to God. He's both. And so in, in the book of Acts, Peter steps forward and he starts preaching his heart out about this fact that this Jesus Christ whom you crucified, God says he is Lord and Messiah. It's not about what he's done, it's about who he is, right? See, he is Lord, right? And when he is Lord, what do we do? Down! And it says that Peter's words pierce their hearts. And their only response, it's the only response that's, that, that's good. It's the only response that anyone should ever, ever say. What should we do? Not what does God have to do to prove himself to me. No. <laughs> he is Lord, right? He is Lord. So what do I have to do in response to to that. Never what does God need to do in response to me. That's the question for all eternity. That's the question for every single person on earth who has ever lived and ever will. What do I do with Jesus Christ? What shall I do? And listen, it doesn't make any difference if it's the baby in Bethlehem or the Christ on the cross he is Lord. He is Lord. Who he is has never changed. From eternity past till forever. Jesus Christ is Lord of all lords. He is the king. Listen, they said, I've come to worship the newborn king. What's that? That means he was already king when he, when, when he, when he came out of He already was. He didn't have to earn it. He didn't have to do anything. Like, he didn't do what normal kings do to become king. He didn't, it wasn't a hostile takeover. I want your land, I'll kill you for it. None of that stuff. 
He didn't prove himself awesome so that people would gang up around him and say, oh, I like this guy, let's make him king. He didn't have an Old Testament prophet come and say, someday God says you're going to be king. He was born, he was king. He was king in the, in the cradle. He was king. And on that quiet night in the sleepy town of Bethlehem, the king of kings has arrived. No celebration, right? No big crowds, no ticker tape parades, no coronation, no explanation, and no demonstration. The king is here. That's it. That's your message for Christmas. The king is here. He hadn't done anything yet to deserve being called king, not in this, on this earth. But even so, the wise men were truly that. They were wise. Very, very wise. And they answered the question of what shall I do with Jesus perfectly? And they said, we have come to worship him. And so, my question to you is, what will you do? Have you worshipped him yet? Have you told him, I acknowledge that you are the Lord. And if you never did another thing good for me ever, you are Lord. If you, if you, if you, didn't, if you don't save my children, if you don't save my neighbors, if you don't prosper my business, if you don't grow this church, if you don't save our country, you are Lord. You are Lord. If you never did a sit, if I didn't draw another breath, you are Lord. Have you done that? Have you done that? Have you really done that? I'm not talking about saying yes. You know what Lord means? You obey what he says to do something. I'm not talking about some formal religious act where you got up and even went to the altar. I'm talking about have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? That means are you listening? When he says to do something, are you doing it? Or are you just wearing a cross on your chain? What this world needs, forget, forget for a moment what you need to do, what this world needs is they need to see authentic followers of Christ. They don't need to see another religious exercise, another religious program. They need to see people open it, read it, and do it. That's what they need to see. And that's what Jesus wants to see. That's, listen, it's not a, it's not a confession with your mouth that Jesus is Lord so much as the confession of your life that makes Jesus the Lord of your life. It's what you do. It's how you act. It's how you think. It's how you love. It's how you forgive. It's all of it. And so what are you going to do? It's Christmas 2018. This is a great opportunity to say, you know what, Jesus? You haven't been the Lord of my life. You've been a figurehead that I've always respected and admired, but you have yet to become the Lord of my life, and I don't want that to be anymore. You deserve for, my, for me to praise you. You deserve for me to bow down before you and call you Lord. And so I'm asking you, unashamed, don't be ashamed of him, or he'll be ashamed of you in his coming. If you have not yet made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you need to, I would just, I'm, I'm just telling you right now, I don't care if you're embarrassed, everyone here would love you, we would embrace you, just, just throw your hand up, just say, I want to be, be a Christ follower, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. Uh, that's it, awesome, there's a, there's, there's a couple right there, that's awesome, praise God. You guys happy about that? I'm happy about that, awesome. Will you help, will you help love them? Will you help teach them? Will you help lead them? Right? They're part of the family. The, the Bible tells us that when, when, when we're in Christ, we're a new creation. The old has died. The old is a new person. They've, they've, they've become a new person when they've embraced Jesus Christ as Lord. His Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you now and to help lead you into obedience to what his word would say. That's an awesome thing that just happened. That's an awesome thing that, that just happened. Listen, if you have been in church forever and you're embarrassed to admit before people, that you have not been following the Lord Jesus the way you should, 
Not the way I would think and not the way Tom would think, but the way your conscience is chewing at you, telling you you are not doing it the way you should have. Raise your hand and dedicate afresh your life to the Lord Jesus. And, just, and you just, you're not raising hands, so we're not going to clap anymore. Just raising it to him so the people, so he could see, this is what I want. Just give your life to Jesus Christ. Awesome, there's someone, there's someone right there. There's another one. He, he loves Jesus two times. He, there you go, awesome. Awesome, here's more, awesome. So, so let's, let's just do this. Let's just pray. Let's just do this right now. Let's just, let's, and then we're going to sing, we're going to worship him, right? Because he's worthy of that. Not for anything that he's, he could possibly do for you for this Christmas. If you're hoping, if you're wishing and praying and asking Jesus Claus to bring you a, a, a stinking toy, forget it. It doesn't make any difference what you want. Just take some time and just be thanking him. Let's just thank him and worship him, not for what he can do, not for this next year that's going to come. Might never come for some of us in this room. You never know. Let's just thank him for who he is. Right? Let's just thank him and worship him for who he is. Lord God, we love you. And we admit, I just, I, I can't do this. You are high and lifted up. And today, Lord, right here in this place, right now, we stand with you. And we say, Lord, that you don't have to prove anything to us ever again. Never will we insist that you do something to prove yourself to us. You are Lord and Messiah, and we bow to you. Lord, I pray for those that raise their hand for the first time. That truly want to put you where you belong. And have a relationship with you that is positionally correct. Where you are the Lord. And you, as Isaiah would say, are high and lifted up. And we are are not. We exalt you, God. We put you in your proper place, on your throne, on the throne of our heart. And Lord, right now, no fancy nothings. We just want to worship you the way you deserve to be worshipped. So as a sign of our worship, revolution, why don't we come to our feet and let's worship the God of heaven.